What's up, everybody? It is Izzy back again with another Q&A today. Thanks for the feedback on the video length yesterday. It kind of seems like 15 to 20 is a sweet spot, so I'll be shooting for that going forward. First question of the day. How to break through mental plateaus while cutting? So <clears throat> first of all, man, you probably aren't even going through a mental plateau. I used to fail diets all the time back in my first like five to six years of doing this. And in retrospect, it's because I thought I knew what I was doing, but I was making really big mistakes. I wasn't eating enough vegetables. I wasn't eating any salad. I was trying to lose too much weight too fast. I wasn't taking deload weeks where I brought my calories back to maintenance. And I was just building fatigue into, into the point where I just broke. So first of all, you probably are just messing up your diet strategy. But let's say you're actually doing everything correctly and this really is a mental issue. I mean, what's the alternative? Are you going to quit? Do you want to have your future or current husband or wife look at you as somebody who just gives up when things get hard? Do you want your kids to look at you as a quitter? Do you want to look at yourself as a quitter? I mean, what, what's the alternative? Are you just going to quit? It's perfectly valid to get as lean as you wanted to get and say, you know what? That wasn't worth it. But you set this goal. It's non-negotiable. Get it done. Finish the job. Did you grow up eating Puerto Rican food? Yes, I did. Uh, my grandma used to make it for me all the time. Um, she started cooking when she was four. She just turned 104 this year. So you could say she's pretty good at it. What app do you use to track your body weight? So I don't know, 95% of the time I just use a spreadsheet app, but uh, for the past couple of years, I've had a smart scale from Fitbit, which automatically syncs my way in with the Fitbit app on my phone, which saves me the trouble of having to type things in myself. So I use Fitbit, even though I do not have a Fitbit anymore. I have a Fitbit scale still, and uh, it creates these beautiful little charts for me as well. When you're doing a powerlifting peaking cycle, should your accessory isolation exercises decrease in reps alongside your main lifts? So here's the thing, a tricep pushdown is already a non-specific movement. It isn't going to offer a lot of direct carryover to any kind of bench pressing. What it does do is it does produce and maintain hypertrophy adaptations. So when you lower the rep range, you're not fundamentally increasing carryover because the movement doesn't offer a ton of overlapping carryover anyway, as it's not specific enough to do so. When you lower the rep range, you aren't increasing the hypertrophy stimulus. It's basically unchanged. However, you are increasing the joint stress, which is a net negative in my opinion. So your isolation should stay high rep. Why doesn't one to one and a half grams, uh, grams of caffeine wake me up anymore? Dude, you have a drug problem. Like, I, I need you to see my face so you can tell like, I'm not f***ing with you. That, that is enough caffeine to poison most people. One time at a powerlifting meet, I accidentally had north of a gram of caffeine. I think I had like two scoops of pre-workout before squat, another scoop before bench, another scoop before deadlift, and it was a strong pre-workout. So I think it was like 250 milligrams or 300 milligrams per scoop. I had to get on the phone with poison control later that night because I was dry heaving, having withdrawal symptoms, cramps, diarrhea, and I literally just laid in the fetal position for like six hours before I finally mercifully fell asleep for like an hour and a half. That is, like I said, enough caffeine to poison most people and you've reached the point where you have a tolerance to it. Seek help. I'm not kidding. Stay away from other drugs. When should I use wrist wraps for hypertrophy training? Uh, the only reason not to use wrist wraps for hypertrophy training is so that when you post your PRs on Instagram, you can brag about how you didn't wear wrist wraps in the caption and are therefore morally and physically superior to all the weak souls out there who need to resort to using wrist wraps. I mean, seriously, there's like no downside to wrist wraps. There's only upside. Use them whenever you want. What is your tempo on calf work and what is the reasoning behind it? So I don't know how you got 300 from watching any, any calf video I've ever done. But anyway, I use a control eccentric on calf work because you should use a control eccentric basically on any muscle group. Uh, I don't exactly count a specific tempo. I just don't know how you can work hard when you're focusing on counting in your head. I use a long pause in the stretch because calves benefit immensely from uh, work in the lengthened position. And because if you don't pause for a good deal of time in the lengthened position on calf work, there's a tendency to just sort of bounce out of the bottom using a lot of rebound from your Achilles tendon. After all, that's kind of what they're made to do. And if you're trying to get bigger calves, the last thing that you want to do is just be exercising the Achilles tendon's ability to uh, store, elastic store elasticity and then bounce. So yeah, that's basically why.
calves really benefit from lots of time in the stretch position. Is it harder for previously overweight individuals to keep fat off? Yes, for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons is that once you reach a certain level of fatness, the, the fat cells will actually reach their maximum storage and your body will simply create new fat cells that are then permanent. And part of the way that we regulate hunger and satiety is actually via the fullness of our fat cells. So once you have more fat cells, you will have hunger mechanisms set off even though you have more overall fat because the fat cells themselves will have the same relative amount. But now that you have more fat cells, you have more fat overall. Also, previously overweight individuals, that's usually indicative of the fact that they don't have good genetics for hunger and fat in the first place. So all in all, yes, but keep in mind, don't make excuses. My heart goes out to people who don't have fitness as one of the main priorities in their life, but if you're like a competitive powerlifter, bodybuilder, or whatever, and this is your main hobby, it shouldn't stop you. So we have two questions here. One is about what to do about a shoulder AC joint injury, and the other is someone has a very specific condition and they're wondering whether or not they should get shoulder surgery. I know this is my fault because I do sometimes occasionally answer like pain and injury questions when I shouldn't, like the herniated disc question the other day. But even though I have this fancy doctor filter, I am not actually a real doctor. And you should not be consulting me about whether or not to get shoulder surgery or what to do about an injury that you yourself may have misdiagnosed. You get that, right? Like, just because you think it's this doesn't mean it actually is. See a PT if you have a shoulder, AC, joint injury. And if you are considering getting surgery, talk to a sports medicine doctor. Get at least two opinions and form your plan from there. Do not ask the fitness guy on Instagram, please. What do you think of ARA as a supplement to increase gains? So there have been exactly two studies that have looked at this directly, um, muscle gains and resistance strain populations. One study found significant increases in gains over an eight-week study. The other didn't find anything at all in terms of improved strength or uh, lean body mass. So this tends to be how it goes in the supplement world in general, is you'll have a very small amount of studies. One out of two will say it does something, or one out of three, the, the findings are equivocal. And that's the problem is, do you want to spend 30 to $60 a month on a very maybe thing? It's just straight up, maybe, maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. One out of two chance. And we don't know if it works beyond the eight week thing or not, you know? So save your money in my opinion. You can spend that extra money on high quality eggs, beef, salmon, etc., And you'll know for sure that those will help your gains. Can I still be a bodybuilder as a firefighter? Well, man, if Ronnie Coleman can win multiple Mr. Olympias while still, still being a police officer, I think you can pursue your hobby while being a firefighter. Do you auto-regulate your rest days like you auto-regulate your deloads? No, I do not because my deloads are auto-regulated based on performance, which means I have to go to the gym and have a bad day to initiate a deload or a devolume. So I've, in the past tried to train every day before and I make it about two weeks before I need a deload or a devolume and a two to one ratio of work weeks to deload weeks is just not good. So in the long run, I've settled on three on one off as about the most I can train without needing deloads too often and while keeping my performance consistent. I also prefer three on one off to something like six on one off because that means I always have the exact same amount of days between each session where if I train six days in a row, that means one of my push days, I'll have one more rest day than the other push day, which means I need to use two, two different push days since they're happening under different recovery conditions. So by doing three on one off, every workout happens under the same recovery conditions, which I really like. What are the best slash most known schools of training in bodybuilding? To be honest, they all pretty much break down into either high volume or high intensity, and the specifics don't really matter. I mean, basically influencers make a living, like creating programs for newbies and intermediates, but I don't do that anymore, and so I'll just tell you the truth. Like, it's, it's about principles. It's not about specific programs. It doesn't matter what specific program that you do. There's no magic in specific programs. You have to know how to manipulate the principles to get something that's custom and tailor-made for your exact situation. And that's where, if there is any magic, that's where the magic happens. For the third straight day in a row, I have had a bad workout. All my lifts are down. Should I finish the week 
or should I start the deload now? Well, what exactly would you gain by finishing the week? You're not capable of setting any PRs. You've already proven that with three straight bad workouts. So all that you would get by finishing the week is you would dig yourself an even deeper fatigue hole with very little stimulus because you're not going to be capable of even beating previous performances or even matching them. So all that you do by finishing the week is maintain your weekly schedule, which is why I don't have one because I don't want to make decisions solely based on the fact that I'm keeping up a schedule where, where certain things happen on a certain day, even though your body doesn't operate on a seven day week. It operates on whatever damn time scale it wants to operate on. So of course you should deal it now. There's no point in continuing to dig, dig a deeper fatigue hole. All right, everybody. Thanks again for checking in yet again with another Q&A here. Um, I will try to get these into that 15 to 20 minute region, as I mentioned. But as of now, if you liked this video, like the video, leave any comments or questions below and subscribe if you haven't already. Have a good day.